Since the passing of legendary strength coach Louis Simmons, I've been receiving many questions on the conjugate system. Lifters want to know exactly how I program it for raw strength and general performance. So in today's video, I'll explain all the important modifications that I believe lead to superior results. And for those who are new here, training with these methods has allowed me to bench press 405 at 185, strict press 225, hit five plates on the way to dip, four plates on the way to pull up, six one-arm pull-ups, deadlifts with over 3.2 times my body weight, and much more, which is all documented here and on Instagram. So all accomplishments aside, maximized programming works, which you'll soon understand. First, let's talk about exercise selection, which is hands down the number one factor in determining conjugate training effectiveness. In many programs that are West Side inspired, it's common to see a lot of partial reps and excessive usage of accommodating resistance. I'm talking about ultra wide high box squats, four to five board presses, strong reverse band bench, squatting with 200 pounds of chains, benching with 150 pounds of chains, combining bands with chains, and sometimes wearing elastic devices like briefs, Titan Ram, wraps, etc. for additional spring. As a result, we end up with a cluster of exercises that are highly specific to wearing squat suits and bench shirts. Not only for perfectly matching their strength curves, but even down to hypertrophy like de-emphasizing pecs and quads. This, my friends, is precisely why some lifters claim conjugate doesn't work for raw lifters. They're criticizing one template of it, which was in fact optimized for equipped powerlifting. I don't blame them for that, but their conclusion is 100% provably false and incredibly disingenuous because exercise selection can vary with any periodization style, especially when viewing different sports. So every movement I just listed can technically be utilized with linear or undulating periodization, even though it's not what you see. But if enough lifters did do this, and that's the hypothetical I'm getting at here, the new sentiment would eventually be linear slash undulating periodization doesn't work for raw lifters. You get why these black and white statements are incorrect. Nuance is everything. So an honest strength coach will claim the following, conjugate or any form of periodization works for raw lifters when exercise selection is specific to raw lifting. Boom, it's really that simple. So rant aside, how about we all stop being biased and explore some exercise modifications for the conjugate enjoyer, starting with adding bands and chains to barbells. If you plan on doing this, it's absolutely essential that you don't use insane tensions. Through years of experimentation, I found you only need a maximum of three variations for either. And nine out of 10 times, the least aggressive options are number one. So for bands, that includes micro minis, mini bands, and monster mini bands. For chains, that's a pair of 30 pounds, 60 pounds, then 90 pounds by mixing both. And just so you know, this version is rarely used unless you're in a peak state. By limiting accommodating resistance, the overall strength curves will still be very heavy in the bottom, but now there's more of a straining effect in the mid position, which is noticeable, but not drastic as seen in those who literally equalize the bar weight to band or chain weight, which I don't recommend at all. In truth, the straight weight number should only be between 10 to 20% less than your regular raw weight. So each tension increase will represent around a 5% jump, which should keep your PRs in a relatively similar zone. Now with these numbers, it's also very realistic to estimate raw one rep maxes. For example, if you bench 295 with 30 pounds of chains, very good chance you can do 315 without them. If you squat 365 with 60 chain, four plates raw is literally a wrap. You deadlift five and a half plates with any double bands and you'll always get six without them which shouldn't be surprising to anyone who has common sense. As long as you don't overdo things and start doing memeified lifts that hide raw strength, you'll be in a perfect spot, all right? And if you're still confused about this topic, please check out this video where I discuss even more nuances like the skill of maxing, weaknesses, and overcoming overuse because I won't repeat that here. Secondly, let's discuss range of motion manipulation beginning with partial lifts. I do use and recommend them, but only through minor reductions. That means you won't ever see an above parallel squat, high rack pull for deadlift carryover, 
or quarter rep presses to build lockout strength. My approach is this, whatever your full range of motion is, cut it back ever so slightly as a variation. So for board presses, use a maximum of a half board to one board. The only people who should ever need a two board are long arm benches, but for everyone else, you want the weight to be slightly above the chest like a spoto press. This way, you'll lose no more than 25 pounds off your press, but give your shoulders a slight break while making the triceps work harder. Just to say, three weeks before me benching 405, I had done 405 off a half board. So the number should be extremely close. For squats, most of this is automatically taken care of through mixing different stances, like wide flat footed low bar and medium heel elevated high bar. Plus, I believe it's always best to use your maximum range of motion. So please don't force a partial rep. But if you do want to break things up for say box squats, the average below parallel height will be 12 inches. So a partial in this case would be adding one inch more by sitting on a mat. Regarding deadlifts, that's a one to three inch block pull tops or lowest pin height in a rack. Again, taller guys can creep this up a bit. Now, you may be wondering what's the point of using mini partials to begin with? The main answer is to complement individual leverages. See, because of varying limb lengths, we are all going to recover differently from the big three. For example, someone with a six foot five wingspan will usually have their arms be way past their body in a bench press, which is basically a massive deficit. So if they try to go too intense with the volume or frequency on only that style, overuse in the pecs can kick in faster, or they'll just have a hard time pushing the intensity and volume, which a lot of you guys have reported over years. However, that same individual would probably have the opposite situation on deadlifts where they can actually use a higher percentage with more reps yet not feel trashed because their pulling mechanics are ideal. Now on the flip side, a short arm lifter will have the opposite situation. There's less range of motion on presses besides the floor press, but more hip flexion on deads. Overall, the muscle biasing effect will be different in both kinds of lifters. Manlets need more triceps and spinal rectors and lanklets need more pecs and posterior chain in general. So how is this accomplished besides just hammering away the competition lifts? Simple, we mix in partials and deficits depending on muscular weaknesses and individualized recovery. So this is what leads to the second application of raw manipulation, including self-limiting variations. These are typically extended range of motion exercises that have a good stimulus of fatigue ratio. This includes ATG squats of any kind, Larson presses, deficit weighted pushups, high bar good mornings, etc. They're motions that provide worse leverages while taking the muscles through a greater length, which is generally superior for hypertrophy and bottom strength development, thus also being specific to raw powerlifting. Anyway, we do this stuff if we wanna get more out of less weight and build more muscle for the main lift we're trying to improve upon. They also yield one-to-one -one carryover or will eventually raise the potential in a significant way. So to sum things up, your training might include 50% normal range of motion, 35% extended range of motion, and 15% partial range of motion. Of course, these values can be reversed depending on what you need, but all this to say, since conjugate training features higher exercise selection, and we all respond differently to compound movements, training with different joint angles that aren't too extreme is best. Thirdly, let's talk about the dynamic effort method. The whole purpose of this is to build rate of force development and explosiveness, which is great for most field athletes and fighters. Velocity is high, and it's typically high sets, low reps with low percentages, thereby focusing on speed strength. Definitely a cool method and is associated with conjugate since we're maintaining multiple performance elements throughout the yearly training cycle, but it's surprisingly not necessary. Why? Because speed training has nothing to do with maximal strength. What will determine your warm-up max is hypertrophy in specific muscles and training the competition movements or variations of them with higher percentages, which is pretty much how every modern powerlifter trains like. So just off that, we can scrap the e-work because we know it's not necessary. And this is what I've done with tremendous success. Therefore, 
feel free to skip it completely. Just have a normal volume day, or if you really want, just add another type of progression for the first exercise, like step loading, any three week wave, or reverse pyramid training. But right after that, you'll wanna go into what was originally scheduled. You'll still complement the max effort days and recovery should be awesome if not better. Not to mention having shorter workouts and being less of a headache, particularly for guys who dislike setting things up or using accommodating resistance in general, since that's the best way to run DE. Remember guys, conjugate training is whatever you make it out to be. Training multiple elements doesn't have to include literally everything. It can be as simple as mixing in high and low percentages with exercises from different worlds, like calisthenics, AKA the Alpha Destiny way. That said, if you insist on incorporating explosive type training, you can always throw in exercises like snatch grip high pulls, power cleans, box jumps, sprints, kettlebell swings, muscle ups, plow push ups, plow pull ups, etc. Or you can use the Matt Wenning approach of low percentage speed work, which is actually way better for raw lifting. So a three week wave would consist of 30%, 35% and 40% with the band and chain tension still being between 25 and 33%. And you wanna follow the guidelines of Prilipin's chart, of course. But yeah, you don't actually need to do speed work, which is all I'm trying to say. Speed work does work, but it's probably more applicable to other sports, not raw powerlifting. Fourthly, since I touch upon developing explosiveness, let's talk about box squats. They're awesome at building dead stop strength since you break up the eccentric concentric chain and they will carry over to your raw squat when done correctly. However, they're surprisingly not necessary even for conjugate. Now, this isn't to say you shouldn't do box squats, but it's more of a question of why would you when there's so many more specific free squat variations to choose from? Like, we're still rotating exercises and using specialty barbells with accommodating resistance, just that there's no box. I honestly don't see this being an issue if your goal is to specifically raise the free squat. So let's put this in perspective. You can do SSB squats, reverse SSB squats, pause squats, high bar heel elevated squats, low bar wide stance squats, front squats, squats with three different band or chain tensions on any bar, deep pin squats, belt squats with a short and long belt, even banding it, camber bar squats, and the list goes on. Basically, you easily have over 15 super effective variations for becoming an elite squatter. So you might as well favor those instead and occasionally throw in box squats if you wanna milk a specific variation for longer. Plus, they're a good deadlift accessory and easy on recovery. So I do enjoy them, but let's keep it real, the majority of your squats should be done without the box, especially volume work, which is much better for working the length and position, which is what we see with most accessories. Whether it's a leg press, split squat, hack squat, whatever, it's either touch and go or paused. So why would things be different with a bar on your back? Newsflash, it's not. And coincidentally, the best raw powerlifters are primarily doing free squats. Therefore, instead of only doing boss squats, either only do free squats or favor them 75% of the time, done deal. Fifthly, let's talk about bench press form and specificity. Ideally, you don't wanna press in a 100% vertical line because we're not wearing a bench shirt. The body's natural pressing tendency and humoroscapular rhythm is a J-type pressing pattern. So instead of forcing the elbows to be maximally tucked and pressing away from you, position them around 45 degrees and allow for some elbow flare past the midpoint. It's a corkscrew effect, mostly vertical, but there is some backwards motion and that's how every elite raw bencher does it. So besides good form cues, a good way to reinforce this pattern is by doing a lot of Larson presses. You'll automatically start doing this as it's the most efficient option for self-limiting variations. Next, I'm in full agreement that a touch and go bench will still build a pause bench because the stretch reflex remains for a good one to two seconds. But I still think the pause bench should be the default style because there is a skill and coordination component that won't be maximized without specific practice and it can take years to hone that in. Also, let's keep it real, most lifters are getting lots of momentum and bounce off their touch and go work. So cutting that out is only beneficial. All you really need is a 0.5 to one second brief pause or you can extend it as a two to three second variation. 
This way, our pecs will never be a limiting factor, and we're practicing how we play, which is important because you don't know how you're gonna be judged in a bench press competition, all right? For hypertrophy and specificity, I don't have a problem with you pausing 100% of the time, including with accommodating resistance. Next, we have to address volume allocation. What's most prescribed is 20% main exercises and 80% special exercises, which is essentially the volume work. I understand this logic and it's technically not wrong since we're always working on weaknesses and strength is strength, but I do believe slightly higher specificity is superior. And this is something I learned from Chad Wesley Smith. See, that 20% refers to max effort and dynamic effort, meaning you'll rarely ever see traditional hypertrophy work being mixed in those variations. That's a problem and is leaving potential gains on the table. So if you max out on a safety squat bar, hitting percentage back downs right after is a brilliant way to train. By following the RPE chart by Mike DeShear, you can select a percentage based on where you are in the mesocycle. If it's your first time doing a percentage back down for this exercise, as in you're maxed out on it recently or literally right before, so early in the session, then you might wanna select an RPE 7. Whereas if it's a repeat exercise, you can gradually increase the RPE to 7.5 to 9 and eventually rotate out that variation based on when it becomes difficult to progress on or if failure is being reached. Then the next exercise we select would be based off a pool of max effort PRs. So we have lots of data to work with and it would be a shame not to take advantage of that. This is what you see in my training. A lot of rep work in the 65 to 70% range many times in the competition movement itself, which is also great for localized hypertrophy. So that's what the criticizers meant when they said west side or conjugate isn't high volume. It's false when viewing total workload, but true when analyzing higher specificity volume. That's the distinction. And I've paid attention to this, which has made the system even better. Finally, let's end off on the topic of rest intervals and GPP. Over the years, many conjugate promoters have recommended getting very fit through conditioning sessions, which supposedly allows for shorter rest intervals to be used in normal workouts, thus quickly getting in and out of the gym while being true to the concept of training multiple modalities. It sounds nice, and I'll be honest, I love the idea of being a fit badass that doesn't live in the gym, but the conclusion for strength development is unfortunately inaccurate. See, it doesn't matter how good your work capacity is. If you're resting too little between sets, the high threshold motor units won't have a chance to fully recover, which gives you less stimulus and lower quality sets. And this is what modern research is consistently confirming to the point where even I had to change my stance on this. Basically, the old advice of resting one to two minutes between sets is subpar, even for isolation movements. In truth, Three to five minute rest intervals provides way better gains. So unless you're doing supersets and giant sets, your workouts probably won't last 45 minutes. They might be an hour and a half, and there's nothing wrong with that. Especially since being conditioned will allow you to do more work anyway. So don't think that work capacity is not important. Now, on the topic of GPP, it's all relative to your sport, and most powerlifters tend to emphasize sled drags and farmer walks, including in reverse, which knees over toes guy has made popular. But for me, I'm not a powerlifter for one, and I prefer high rep calisthenic circuit style workouts. They are incredibly humbling and get you fit like no other. If you guys don't believe me, please check out Iron Wolf and attempt any of his normal workouts. It really is cardiovascular punishment and is so brutal on endurance and mindset that when you go back to lifting weights, including leg days, nothing will compare. And that's one of my secrets to developing psychotic work capacity. GPP at least twice a week through mostly body weight training. Burpees, lunges, squats, dips, pull-ups, just pumping it to the max, bro. And the summertime, I love doing daily jogs as well. But honestly, you can condition the body however you want. Moral of the story is get fit because health and not being gassed out matters. But also recognize that this is separate from your strength training. And with that said, I'm completely done covering my main conjugate training recommendations. I hope you enjoyed this extensive overview and now want to hear your feedback. What changes 
what you make to the system. Let's hear it, and I'll talk to you all next time.